What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Hey, Hard to Tell podcast, episode 199. Last triple digit episode with a one in the front. Yeah. That's right. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. 199. We won't be here no more. Then we're going to start putting twos in front of these episodes. Yeah. Look at Brian. Brian's so happy. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here. Thank you for listening. As always, we have a lot to get into in this episode. Good things to talk about. Got a good guest coming up that we're really excited to talk to as well about a lot of things. But talked about this earlier on the NBA Exchange this week. NBA is back. We've had a week into the season. Brian and I were just talking with our producer, Greg, about a little fantasy basketball. Some people I'm trying to get rid of already on the team because I don't <laughs> I don't trust them to stay healthy. We'll get into that in a, another time. But the NBA is back. Um, look. I don't know about you, B. I'm I'm not somebody to go crazy about the first week. Never. I'm not going crazy over three games. Uh, I know before we record this podcast, the day before the Knicks dropped one to Orlando, didn't have me too happy. Yeah. But you know, what what are your thoughts early on thus far with the NBA in the first week? Yeah, I, I don't try to make any grandiose statements after just a few games. <clears throat> or whatever the case may be, excuse me. Uh, I will say that there are some things that I expected to happen that have happened early, like the Charlotte Hornets being this young and exciting team and LaMelo Ball taking a step, it looks to be the case early, although they didn't need him to put the Nets away in Brooklyn because that became the Ish Smith show. And look, I love the six-foot veteran backup Ugh. point guards who just hang around. You know what I'm saying? The C.J. Watsons, remember him from back then, <laughs> back in the day? Not that it was that long ago, but... Those are my type of dudes. And Ish Smith, like, he's he's very reliable and I think very ideal to come off that bench for Charlotte. Charlotte's a low-key deep team. Miles Bridges is taking another step. So he looks to be, uh, you know, somebody to monitor going forward. Um, I think that Tyler Hero sort of may have a star turn. We'll see. Uh, we some, people, some people think. There we go. Some people, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> some people How think you that, don't do that. <laughs> some people, some people think that he might lead the team in scoring. I'm not going that far. I'm not sure if that'll be necessarily a good thing, unless it's like Manu Ginobili ish, where he did it with the Spurs. But it kind of depends. I think you'd rather see Bam do that. But look, he's had a 30 point, 10 rebound game. He had another big game before that, and I think he he's my sixth man of the year favorite. Other than that, like. You know, we'll see with the Lakers. It wasn't great. Uh, it it was cool to see Melo drop twenty eight against the Grizzlies, but you know they're still trying to figure out the rust fit. He did have fifteen points and thirteen assists. I loved his playmaking last time. Although I'm kind of with the 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 vocal minority growing that think that Russell Westbrook would be better suited to come off the bench as the team's sixth man because of how he could operate with that second unit and be a little more free instead of having to adjust to like LeBron and Anthony Davis and be on the floor at the same time at all times. I think that's what's helping Tyler Hero out, by the way, is because he's coming off the bench and not starting and having to account for Butler's there, Lowry's there. Like certain guys, you just get more out of them if they come off the bench. And I think Russell Westbrook, you could come off the bench and be a super sub and play still 28, 30 minutes a game and still do what you do and have an easier path to do it. But I'm glad the NBA is back, but goddamn, like ugh, there's so much basketball. Like, I was just the first few days, the first week or whatever. I, I forgot Insecure started last night. Didn't even watch it. You know what ne- I mean? Ne- like, neither did I, but that's for other reasons. But, yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I just was busy. Like, it just didn't happen. I will get to it probably after we finish this podcast. Yeah, I'm going to get to it hopefully tonight. But, look, uh, other than that, I have all Brian teams because I didn't get to them last week. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> all Brian teams are going to be two things. They're going to either be full of heat players or... Or they'll be full of short players. That's what you. That's that. That's what you'll know. It'll be. It'll be full of that. Um, 
Early in the season, here's one that I think for me in terms of teams that look good. I agree with you on the Hornets. They're as exciting as we thought they'd be. I don't know how good they're going to be. I talked about this earlier on the NBA Exchange. Chicago Bulls, 3-0. Yeah. But, but let's pump the brakes, okay? I one, I, one, I don't believe in the Bulls' defense. And two, the Bulls have played nobody. They played the Pistons twice and I believe the Pelicans, okay? Like, let's yeah. let's let's – Let's relax a little bit here with the Chicago Bulls. Now they play, and we're, we're recording this, they're going to play Toronto uh, tonight. So you got to be who's in front of you. I'm never somebody to hate on somebody. You got to take care of business, which the Knicks didn't do in their last game against Orlando. But that's a whole nother story. You got to take care of business. I just need to see more from Chicago. I got to see them do this against good teams with good defense, and then I will be impressed. Right now they've taken care of business, but I'm not overly impressed as some people have been to run on the Chicago train. The team in the West that's caught my eye where I'm like, uh, we might have something here because of how they're playing. Well, two teams. One, Memphis. Memphis fought, beat the Clippers, almost beat the Lakers to send them to 0 and 3. John ja Morant just missing a, a free throw. And he had hitting 40, threes, by hitting the way. Hitting threes. Who had yeah. a 40 and had a 40 piece. He's looking really good. If Memphis takes another step, this will have our boy Gerard Hector super excited, especially if Triple J starts putting up some numbers. He looks good. The he's other still not team, rebounding like that, though. No, he's not, which I know, <laughs> which I know annoys you. And I'll go out and live and say he probably did not make your All Brian team, I, which I know is the case because he doesn't <laughs> no, rebound he like not. that. Yes, he did. No, he did not. <laughs> no, he did not. Uh, before we get to that, the Warriors. I'm impressed with the Warriors. The reason why is. Some of the additions they made that were smaller additions that I don't think people went super crazy for, Otto Porter, Imani Belisha, who's been fantastic for them. He just seems like a player that when you think about it, you're like, ah, oh, should have known this before. He would fit in Steve Kerr's system. He actually does. Passes well for a big guy. Has a little nice touch. Can stretch the floor. Works for what they're doing. Everybody in that Warrior system seems to be playing well. The ball is moving well. They're a lot more fluid. I think it helps that they have Jordan Poole coming off the bench, who's a really good scorer. That helps Andrew Wiggins. Looks like a competent player. Got that vaccine. And <laughs> we'll see, you know, just how they are. But I like their the DNA that's sort of around the Warriors. It seems to be coming back. If they get Wiseman and as they get Clay, if those guys are good, they could be dangerous because I just like the way they're playing. And Curry, Draymond looks, he knows what he's doing. They just look more competent this year. That And their defense is actually not bad either. That's the other thing. So watch out I said, watch out for the Warriors early trend, but let's not go crazy. Because, you know, we could be doing this pod next week, episode 200, and talking about teams that we thought were really nice at 3-0, and and now they're 3-3. Three and three. That really can happen. And so you don't, you don't want to get too crazy. Okay, let's get to these All-Brian teams, right? Oh, come on, people. You know what it is. Do, you, do we need a definition of the All Brian team? I do you have know them what, if we need it. A definition of well, a definition of what the All Brian team is. Uh, yeah, I have rules. Oh, there are rules. Oh, see, I like this. I like this I have criteria. Yeah. Criteria matters. You know, I like that. B. criteria matters, and you can't be just making these lists up and you have no rules like the NBA seventy five list where they just give the guys who want the NBA fifty automatic placements. Didn't like that. Shit is whack. Don't like it. Oh, you what? Okay, we'll get into that in another. Should have started from zero. That's how I feel. You got to start okay. from zero. Because some of them dudes up on the NBA 50 need to get them up out of here. They don't I don't, need to be I don't, up on there. I don't disagree. I don't yeah. disagree. Yeah. Bob Cousy. Bye. <laughs> Time to get him up out of here. Up I, was here. I was listening to Levitard and Mike Ryan, the producer. He was saying that they need to get George Mike in out because he was shooting like 40% and he had multiple seasons of shooting 30 something percent as a center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who else? Who I forgot. There's somebody else like like that. Kuzi's playoff shooting numbers aren't good. He was ten and seventeen in the postseason before Bill Russell came along. He basically was riding Bill Russell's coattails. That's another story. I'm not, I'm not with it. I'm, okay. I'm not getting into the basketball that I was here long before. Uh, even my dad was, I think. So yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Talk, Greg talking about coming at Kuzi. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Some of them old dudes got to get up out of there. It just is what it is. <laughs> Things evolve. Things happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, things happen. We got to start count talk. We need to talk about basketball. You know what should be on the list? I don't want to disregard everybody before, but everything before the ABA merger, what? Yeah. You know, fucking, yeah. Let and, it go. 
And just in general, like, remember the college game back then? That was when dudes were getting 20, 25 rebounds because we think the the the, the, the pace is fast now. Back then, it was crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it wasn't built on corner threes or whatever. Everyone was just driving into each other and shit. Like, you yeah. know, it was different. <laughs> different, different game. All right. The All-Brian team has criteria, people. Please, Brian, tell us what is the criteria for one to make the uh, – Highly anticipated, highly coveted list of the All Brian team for NBA rules and regulations. Keep the camera on both of us, Greg, because I want to see I, I want to see Dexter's reactions to this. Uh, but very simple rules: uh, fifteen players, three teams, so five each team. Uh, no more than three All Stars because that would be cheating. Uh, no more than three All Stars from last year, from the season before. No okay. more than three. Hold on, no more than three All Stars from last year per team. Correct? No, no, no. A, a total. Oh, total. you can't have more than three all-star appearances total. But no, no, player no. Can. No, like, I cannot choose more than oh, three okay. all-stars from last year to be on this team. Because gotcha. then that would be just be cheesy. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Like, we're, we're not doing that. Gotcha. Um, good defender preferred, adequate required. Um, willing <laughs> passer preferred. Uh, at, least one, <laughs> at least one career brouhaha. Um... Wow, that's an interesting one. Okay. At least one. But not surprising. For, for people who don't know, that's Brian's way of not saying violence. But yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, scuffle, whatever. Uh, pest preferred, but not required. Um, <laughs> I got to want you on my team and must not be a coward on the floor. Uh, okay, so there okay. we go. That, that, okay. that's, that's our criteria. First team, you're going to roll your eyes. The first team is the one where you're going to roll your eyes. Well. Should I start at three or should I go to, should I start at first and work my way So down? I started the first and go down to third. I okay. want to know how highly you think of the people on the first team. Okay. The center. So hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Yes. Can I guess the amount of heat players that are on the first team? Go ahead. There are three of the five <laughs> players are heat players on the first team. Am I right? Three. Yes. Three. Uh, I go think ahead. the, I think the only ones, um, but yeah. So we'll get those out. We'll get those out the way. We'll get those out the way. Oh, the two, the two guards, uh, Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry, because I did go by position here. Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry, all Brian team uh, for this pending season. We'll see how that goes at the end of the year for obvious reasons. I don't need to explain that. The two forwards, uh, Bam Adebayo and Bobby Portis. I went with Bam as a forward here so I could make room. Bobby Portis is a first teamer. First wow, teamer. Okay. First right. teamer. Because it's not like I'm talking about. You know, the spirit of the old Brian team, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be the skill. Although, you know, if, if I go down the list, you can see why he makes an argument here. So this is not like player rankings or whatever the case may be. This is about how much you embody what it is I'm looking for, right? That's why our center is Nikola Jokic, who's the only returning starter from last year. Uh, because wow. he, he, listen, them Serbian motherfuckers. I mean, you saw his brothers, you know he what I mean? He don't play defense though. Uh, I said adequate required and I adequate guess. defender last year. You know, adequate defender. You know I what guess. I mean? Like the passing, he has everything else. Uh, and look, you saw who was it that he got into a confrontation with last year? Was it Cameron Payne? Yo. Or, or Devin I, Booker? One of them two? They were I the want to say, I, I want to say, it was, was both. I think it was both. I think he it was walked Booker up to them and, and he was like, What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Booker, <laughs> whoever it was, all I remember is they wanted no parts of that. They wanted no parts of that. <laughs> Okay, that's the first team. Who we got in the second team? Uh, Greg put it up there. But for those listening who didn't catch that, Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry is the backcourt, Bobby Portis, and Bam Adebayo are the forwards, and Nikola Jokic is the center. The second team, the second team is very fun, uh, very feisty also. Uh, the guards, Fred Van Vliet and R.J. Barrett. R.J. Okay. Barrett, RJ Barrett has okay. the right amount of fuck you that I like, and I think he might be a first teamer <laughs> next year. You know what I'm saying? Like, R.J. Barrett, look. And we're sleeping on his defense. You saw what he you did know, to Jason did Tatum, Tatum the first yeah, game of the he season. Did. He locked him up. He locked like, him up. I, look, I've been high on R.J. Barrett uh, since he was at Montverde, and I saw him when he was a high school sophomore at Nationals, at Geico Nationals, then Dick's Nationals. And I thought he was the best player I saw there, and that included, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. was there and guys from that draft class. Scotty Barnes, uh, I think, might have been his teammate, actually. So, yeah. Um, R.J. Barrett and Fred Van Vliet, who, I mean, I love Fred Van Vliet. You know what I'm saying? Any guard who is six feet tall and could average more than half a block per game, like, you're in. You're in. You're in. <laughs> Forwards. Uh, Jay Crowder. Duh. I'll need to get into why. Uh, what a shock. Juan Toscano Anderson. From yo, the Golden State Warriors. Yo, yo, <laughs> yo. That man had a good season last year. And has caught and stuck around in the league and is a solid rotation player. 
and it's feisty. You're right about this group having some feistiness. You know when you do when you play 2K and you tend to like build your team or whatever. For some reason, the small forward ends up being like the scrappy defender, whatever the case may be, because you got a playmaker, you got a guard that can score, you want bigs that can do a certain thing. Juan Toscano Anderson t- tends to be like the small forward that I wind up with, and yeah. the center, the center is Rashawn Holmes. A stalwart on my fantasy team. One of my favorite players in the league, and I think one of the most underrated players in the NBA. So yeah. Okay. Second team, home. feisty. I like it. So Third second team. team, Fred Van Vliet, RJ Barrett, Jay Crowder, Juan Toscano Anderson, and Rashawn Holmes. Mm. Uh, the third team. <laughs> I, I almost want to start at the center and work my way down, but I'm going to start at the guards. No, no, no. I'm going to start at the centers because it's going to be more entertaining for the finish. The center is Al Horford, Dominicano. You know what I'm wow. saying? Al, we got Horford, a, Al Horford's the there. Team. Al Horford's on the huh. third team. You know what I'm saying? Because we got to get some Latinos on here. We ain't got that. Okay. NBA. Um, forwards. Larry Nance Jr. Okay. And Udonis Haslam. I mean. <laughs> Udonis Haslam? He barely <laughs> played last. He played in one game last year, got a fight with Dwight Howard. He's the 15th man on the team he's on. And he's the 15th man here. That's all. You know? He, like You need the OG in the locker room. I'll say this. If every locker room had a Udonis Haslam, there'd be less fuck shit in the NBA. Udonis, if there would not be a Kyrie Irving situation if Udonis Haslam oh, was in that locker oh, room. Oh, oh, I believe that. I do believe that. <laughs> like, I do believe you, that. You just, you just need the warden. You know what I'm saying? You need the OG there. Um, the backcourt. TJ McConnell. Who, wow. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> the first, oh, wow. first white boy we got in here. Oh, well, Jokic. First American yes. white boy we got in here. Wow. Didn't and, see that coming. And the only one, because the other guy, joining him in the backcourt, Facundo Cumpaso. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you have to have one guy who is an absolute pest, and there he is. He is my absolute. new Patrick Beverly, baby. You know what I'm saying? Wow. <laughs> he is my new Patrick Beverly. So to reiterate, the center is Al Horford. The forwards, Udonis has up Larry Nass Jr. The guards, Facundo Cumpaso. And TJ McConnell, I got three Latinos. Facundo Compasso, remember, is from Argentina, not Italian. And that's fine, Greg, that the third team is trash, as you write in the chat. We're, this is the third team. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they probably won't play a whole lot. Although Larry Nance Jr., listen, I think he could average five assists per game if he just got the ball more. Because that motherfucker could pass. Um, I, so, yeah. I, I, could, I, could have seen, I could have seen a vote for Nerlens Noel. I thought he could have got a little love there. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other tests that I like. Um. Oh, what's my man on? Uh. Oh, you know who I like. I'm surprised he make your team. I thought you'd like him. You seem like somebody who would get down with Dylan Brooks. I feel like Dylan Brooks would be a a, a, a Brian All Star kind of guy. I have a yes. watch. I have a watch list. I have a watch list. Yeah. See, okay. Greg. Greg. Greg was right on it with me with Dylan Brooks. Dylan yes. Brooks is in my watch list. I just want to see a little bit more. Right. Um, for Compazzo, remember, I was watching him when he was in Argent playing overseas for years. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I knew who this dude was already. Dylan Brooks is on the watch list for this year. Scotty Barnes is on the watch list because he looks at people before he dunks on them, and I find that very entertaining. Um, Trey Young is on the watch list because, I mean, you know, like, <laughs> I didn't want to overload this with all stars, but Trey Young is on the watch list. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with, uh, LaMelo Ball, Tyler Hero, and, uh, Jakar Sampson. Jakar Sampson. Jakar Sampson. Okay. Jakar Sampson is currently overseas right now. I believe he's in Italy. But uh, I looked up some scuffles from last year. I looked up a couple, multiple compilations of different fights from last year. Jakar Sampson appeared multiple times, and I liked what I saw. <laughs> I'm nothing else, folks. Only Brian would do research to look up scuffles. Only he would do research, but he's doing it. I don't even know. You know what? I just realized something. He's doing it because he likes it. The doing it for the all Brian team is just a lie. He just made it into something that he does in his time anyway. So why not make a team out of it? And now that's how we have the all Brian team. <laughs> Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support 
helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. All right, we've got a special guest joining us today. Always excited to talk about things in the world of sports and sometimes outside of the world of sports. He is the Latino Rebels, which Brian also writes for, Capital Correspondent, Pablo Manriquez. Pablo, hey, hey. welcome to the Artel you? Podcast. We're good, man. How are you? Man, you know, I can't complain. It's um, So basically, it's Monday here in the Capitol, and uh, business here gets started usually in the late afternoon on Mondays because lawmakers fly back into the Capitol Hill from all across the country. Uh, so the Senate just voted about half an hour ago. So I was running around trying to find senators to ask them about what's called the PRO Act, which strengthens union protections, uh, and also about like uh, immigration reform, which is kind of stalled right now in the Senate. But now that, uh, you know, they voted on a couple of confirmations for the Biden administration. I'm on the House side, actually, in this booth, mm -hmm. uh, which I've never sat in before. It's kind of warm, but it's, it's kind of cozy, but it's also kind of, uh, it's kind of nice. It's kind of private. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll be uh, running back downstairs to get House members. So Senate to House today. Tomorrow, it'll be reversed. It'll be House to Senate. So, and they'll be back and forth all day. That sounds like a lot of back and forth and a lot of running, uh, yeah. Pablo. It sounds right. like that. Go back and forth in Congress. <laughs> well, we're glad, we're glad to have you on. And Absolutely. I know there's, there's a lot that Brian and I want to ask you, but I think maybe the first or most important question here is, you are a Latino man, and we do not see a lot of our Latino brothers and sisters covering the White House, right? Covering the Capitol. How, I'm, I don't have to ask how important it is, but I think for you, getting credentials to, co to cover the White House, you know the importance of it. There you go. He showed his credentials if you're watching. Mm -hmm. He showed it. That's right. Um, how do you, like, i am got to feel like there's a sense of pride in that because of what I just said. We don't see a lot of a lot, you know, brothers and sisters. Right, Pablo? I think it's a sense of pride. It's certainly a sense of pride. It's certainly a sense of accomplishment, but it's also a sense of despair because um, there are probably 2,000 reporters that are credentialed to cover Congress, as I understand it, the number is about 2,000. And this is considerably less, considerably fewer reporters than there were, say, 10, 20, 30 years ago at uh, the sort of when newspapers were more in their heyday. So as a result, there are fewer reporters covering the Capitol. And since the beginning, as I, as, from what I can tell from doing a pretty extensive study of this when we were going for our press pass, uh, there have never really been, a, it's never very, really been a very diverse press corps. I'll say that like there are other Latinos who, who do cover the Capitol with me. Um, there are very, very, very few and far between, but there are other Latinos. There are a few other Asian people, too. I would say this much, though. There are even less than Latinos, even less than Asian Asian people. There are uh, shamefully few black people on the congressional beat specifically. I know that mm -hmm. in the White House side of things, they've been diversifying more. I know under the Biden administration, they've been really adamant about making sure that like, more reporters of color get questions at the uh, at the briefings over there in the White House. I just got my White House press on Thursday of last week. So we look forward to asking questions of the Biden administration. But up here on Congress, which is a very much a different game, you know, there, there are over 500 members of Congress that you can come. And once you have a press pass, you can come, you can uh, explore the hallways uh, in between the different court, you know, the, the, the committee rooms, the offices and things like this of power um, with a lot of freedom. You know what I mean? So um, one of the, you know, I don't necessarily think it's that surprising that immigration reform, voting rights, always find themselves, these, these issues that are really important to uh, communities of color often find themselves sort of like as the third rail of politics, because I think that within the building, uh, it's not just the press that's very white, it's also in the staffer ranks and certainly in the, um, the, the elected official ranks, very white. So there aren't always necessarily the points of relativity of what this means within your community. If you're a person of color in the United States, you're, 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 your perspective isn't always uh, the mainstream or isn't always like sort of the norm, if you will, uh, in the Capitol, the way it might be during a Biden White House as opposed to a Trump White House or during an Obama White House as opposed to, say, like uh, a Bush White House or a Reagan White House or a White House before that. So, yeah, it's a great sense of accomplishment. We love what we do. We love being here. We know it's a privilege to cover the Capitol. Not everyone gets to do it. We fought hard for this privilege. We got this privilege. We're going to keep this privilege and we're going to keep breaking news. Uh, but it can't just be us because I think that what you'll find is in the past, some real pioneers that have helped integrate the press galleries because when you, when you cover the Capitol, you're in one of four press galleries. I'm in the daily press gallery. I was in the 
periodical press gallery for a time. There's also the um, the photographer's press gallery and the radio TV press gallery. So there is a great privilege to be in one of these galleries covering, right? But um, I think that one of the big uh, challenges that's come in the past with people who have helped integrate the press galleries to include more women, more Black people, more Latinos, and so on, is that once they were in the door, um, you know, that was enough, right? And I'm not saying they pulled the ladder mm-hmm. up per se. I think that women, especially in the last five or 10 years, have really, really risen in the ranks of Capitol Hill reporters. I think that there are a lot more women up here than you would have found when I arrived in Washington at the beginning of the Obama administration about 13, 14 years ago, you know? So there are a lot more women in the ranks of the Capitol Press Corps. There are a lot more women in the ranks of the White House Press Corps. Uh, but now, we, now I mean, it, reporters of color, considerably less so, like considerably less so. Uh, we are here, but we're few and far between. So I think that, like, one of the things that's important is that, you know, there are gatekeepers that run uh, credentialing and things like that in the in the Capitol. And, and, and there are there are associations that do it at the White House as well. So I think that it's important that reporters of color do run for those positions to become the gatekeepers themselves so they can add their perspective to uh, when the decisions are going to be made about who gets this high level access to the most elite beats in American politics. I know that's a long answer, but <laughs> I mean, a good one. But yeah, okay. it, it's a great one. It was a necessary one. I mean, Dad, you said a lot. There's so much to follow up on. But one I want to do in particular is because I know a little bit about this, but I feel like <clears throat> we should still discuss this. Just the process of getting credentialed again, because that was a fight. And, you know, Julio had tweeted about it and Latino rebels also that, you know, just trying to get credentialed and them not respecting Latino rebels and not respecting you, et cetera, et cetera. Initially, can you just walk us through the process of that fight? Because it went on for a while and obviously now (laughs) you've won. But like it, it also speaks to, you know, to all your points you just laid out. It shouldn't have been that much of a process. And, you know, this tends to only happen to people that look like you or I or Dexter. Right. So I think that like definitely. So I, there was there are two press galleries that have to, that will that are relevant to like a, a news website typing, like reporting operation. Right. Not having not requiring like a radio or a TV, or an audiovisual component or not requiring the special considerations that photographers get. So they are the daily press gallery and the periodical press gallery. And they used to just be one press gallery back in the day. I think the galleries were founded in 1879, if I remember correctly from my research. But they split over time because there were a lot of magazines back in the day. Like, you know what I mean? Paper magazines people used to buy off off the newsstand. So the periodical press gallery kind of split away from the daily press gallery, which is the daily press gallery is run by the Standing Committee of Correspondence. The periodical press gallery is run by an executive committee. But the OGs of press credentialing, the OG uh, press credentialing entity has always been the daily press gallery. It has always been the, the standing committee of correspondence that runs the daily press gallery. So our first credential was in the periodical press gallery. The mm. periodical press gallery, which is historically for magazines, is all virtually interchangeable with the daily press gallery. Like they're totally, in my opinion, they're very redundant and only one of them should exist. It should be the daily press gallery like it has been for over 100 years. But the periodical press gallery does exist. The difference is, and the difference that I think is sort of very important to, to, to touch on, the difference between the daily press gallery and the periodical press gallery, which these are the gatekeepers that decide whether or not you can cover Congress, is that the uh, standing committee of correspondence that runs the daily press gallery, which I'm a part of now, is elected. It's elected by members of the press, right? The uh, executive committee of the periodical press gallery is not elected. They just kind of appoint themselves, right? And like, you know, when one person steps down, they appoint the next. That's, that's as I understand it, how it works. So when we were in the periodical press gallery for a month on a one month temporary pass, right? This unelected uh, press gallery, which, I mean, in my humble opinion, they run more like a locker room, whereas the daily press gallery where I'm in now, they're run by professionals, you know. So the periodical press gallery, which is not well run, decided that they didn't want to renew our past. And they said the reason why uh, was because uh, we like Futuro Media wasn't good enough or something like that, that we we didn't like comply with the rules or whatever. Uh, And I think that part of it was because I, uh, you know, I think I tweeted at one point that I was freelancing, right? And so they kind of threw the hammer at me. They're like, fuck this guy. He's out of here. And, oh, sorry. Can I cuss? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Oh, <laughs> okay, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were like, fuck this guy. He's out of here. You know, no freelancers. But I tell you right now, there's a ton of freelancers in this building. There's a ton of people that have real nice business cards that say like, you know, Bloomberg or whatever on it or a New York Times. And they're freelancers, right? Like they, they don't have benefits and stuff like that, right? They get money mm. per story. So they were singling us out. 
um, I think in part, like, because, uh, in part because, you know, yeah, I, I, we were in, in essence breaking like one of the rules a little bit that everybody breaks, like this common practice to break, but also because we were establishing a new beat, like no one had ever come into the Senate, for example, and started asking immigration questions on a daily basis. Immigration mm-hmm. isn't seen as a daily beat in this town until Latino rebels made it so, because as mm-hmm. immigrant people from immigrant communities know, it is a daily, it is a daily thing to be an immigrant in this country. You know, you don't get to take days off. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anywho, uh, after they declined to uh, renew our press pass, me and Julio like kind of like took our case all over the place to the New York Times, to all these different places, uh, the the Aldea News. We were pretty upset. That was uh, the tweets that you were referring to, and we uh, requested a um, we requested a, pay, a periodical. Uh, we, we had a choice, right? We could either appeal the decision by the unelected executive committee of the periodical press gallery to come right. back into the gallery, or we could apply to the parallel gallery, which is run by, in my opinion, people who are a lot more interested in having a diverse press corps. You know what I mean? They are Rachel Oswald from CQ Roll Call, Emily Cochran from the New York Times, Matt Fuller from the Daily Beast, Jonathan Salant from uh, the, the New Jersey newspaper, and uh, Tom Brun from Newsday. These people actually care. Like, they people, these people get it. Like, they know that the press is changing, The press, that, that there are a lot of things that don't get covered that should get covered, Right. Um, uh, in Congress and elsewhere. So if somebody's going to come up and ask about voting rights every day, about uh, immigration every day, just because there's not a ton of lobbying money being thrown at the issue, like there might be on like an environmental issue or like a defense issue or any number, or like even like a gender issue nowadays, you know what I mean? Like, well, what's going on in Texas, right? These are questions that uh, lawmakers expect to get every day from reporters that are dedicated to, be- to the beat, but that's just not the case in immigration. And the thing that like is kind of, that has that was a mystery to me until I did get recredentialed into the periodical press gallery. Is why isn't why? I mean, there are a lot of Latinos that are credentialed, for example, in the daily press and ga- the radio TV press gallery who work for Univision, who work for Telemundo, who work for NTN twenty four. Why aren't they in here asking questions um, of the senators? You know, they they are very very good at covering the press conferences, like the sort of packaged media events. But I never see them in the hallways. And so I started asking questions about this. This is actually, a, you, know, for, you heard it here first, folks. But I'm writing a story about why that is. And it's kind of a, it's a tough story about um, back in the day when Harry Reid, the senator from uh, Nevada, was the majority leader in the Senate. Um, you know, he created the first ever dedicated team for Hispanic press, right? And they encouraged people to come into the tunnels, to come into the hallways and stuff like that and ask questions the way, you know, the white reporters do. Uh, but they, the, the sense that I'm getting from both the OGs who covered it back then and the Hill staffers who kind of like tended to them and tried to make them feel included was that they got so many eye rolls from the mm. I hate to say it, but like the white press in the building that they didn't really feel comfortable being in here. But like, you know, I'm half white. I'm raised in Missouri. That's not like an issue for me. You know what I mean? I don't give a shit if people eye roll me. Like I'm still going to ask my <laughs> question. And if they ask a question that's like, stupid, I'm going to eye roll them back because it's like, you know, whatever. It, it, I mean, if we're going to behave like high school, that's fine. So long as I get my story, I get my questions and I find my guy and I ask my question and that's fine. I'm, I'm not here to police what they do, but all of a sudden they were policing what we did earlier in the summer. And I was just like, hold the fucking phone a second because that's right. going to work. You know what I mean? So I guess like that, another long explanation of kind of what happened and it's very technical, but we were in a shitty press gallery that shouldn't exist. And we finally got into the main press gallery of actual news professionals that run a credentialing operation that makes sense and is forward thinking. So where we are right now, I'm very happy with, we have a three-month temporary credential that we renew every three months. We're asking now for a one-year temporary credential that we can renew for a year. And the reason why that is, why we're not permanent yet, is because we're a totally new outlet, right? right. So there are outlets like the New York Times, Boston Globe, or whatever. They've been credentialed in these galleries for over 100 years, right? For Futura Media, we're 10 years old. Well, you know, we're over 10 years old, but like the, we have an, in Latino Rebels, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Mm-hmm. Uh Oh, if, 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 you know, if they, if they can recredential us for a year or six months and then like, you know, maybe next year we'll like ask formally to become a, per, a permanent member of the daily press gallery, that'd be a huge deal for Latinos because, you know, if I get hit by a bus, uh, they'll be, they won't have to like go and apply and wait and fight and cry and scream. Right. Uh, they'll just have a place in this press corps, um, you know, for time and moment. it'll be ours to lose basically. So let's what, hope you so don't get, let's hope you don't get, we don't want you to be hit by a bus, <laughs> Pablo. We don't, we don't want, but Pablo, You're doing great work. we don't want that. We don't want that. But Pablo, with, with you saying that it, it makes me think about not just you being there as a Latino man covering, you know, covering, uh, the white house, covering the Capitol. 
it's also important for independent journalism that we're talking about here to independent people to tell stories. I know we have Huffington Post Latino, NBC Latino uh, has that. I know those outlets are good, but for Futura Media and Latino Rebels is independent journalists to do. But there was something that I read in the uh, Aldea article that kind of covered you guys not getting uh, the credentials or having them revoked. And you had a quote that I just really stood out to me um, that somebody said that you were too visible. Um, well, words that, that don't, about, yeah. yeah. And I was like, and I was like, this was my thing, Pablo. I just want an explanation. I don't know if you got it, but what does that mean? Right? Like, what does that, I feel like it's code. I think we know right. that as people of color, yeah. but what does that mean? So there's one area of the Capitol where you're not allowed to wear tennis shoes and you're not allowed to wear a hat, right? But somebody at some point along the way was like, oh, you're not allowed to wear a hat or tennis shoes in the Capitol. I was like, that's not true. I see people wear a hat and tennis shoes in the Capitol all the time. Like there are women, I, there was there was one reporter in particular. There was a woman who was pregnant and she was wearing tennis shoes. As you know, she should be allowed to wear tennis shoes. All she needs to, you know, what I mean, who, well, be comfortable for crying out loud. And then there was another. I was a photographer who wore a hat. Said uh, I forget the name of the photography brand. And I was like, well, if he can wear a hat and she can wear tennis shoes, then I can wear a hat and tennis shoes. So I think that like it was one of those things. It was just sort of like. I was coming in, I was asking a bunch of questions nobody had ever asked before, and they weren't necessarily coming from a place of deep experience coming covering the Capitol. They were just questions that I found interesting as somebody who, I worked at Roll Call, the newspaper of note for Congress for over 50 years, uh, and I, I, I was their publicist, but I was kind of privy to a couple of stories that we worked on that I thought were interesting that we could maybe like follow up on more. So that said, I guess like uh, one of the things when like, you know, I've come up as like a party spokesperson, a publicist, like a bunch of like different political jobs I've done over the year. And all of a sudden I was like, you know, a reporter. And I think that there was a lot of resistance to that. You know what I mean? But the fundamental problem with the claim that like we shouldn't be here, like Latino rebels, like whether you're too visible or not. My, my uncle actually, here's a good, you know, this is my white side. My uncle was the fastest breaking news reporter in the Capitol for like 20 years, you know, for the Memphis Commercial Appeal, Bar Camille, uh, uh, Appeal Bartholomew Sullivan. And he told me that your style doesn't like, the, you know, it, your style of your reporting has no consideration when it comes to your credentialing. And I was like, that's right. interesting. It's not about how you do it. They credential Futuro Media. They don't credential you personally. They credential right. Futuro Media. Futuro Media, if they have a problem with your style, they can tell you. And that's kind of the way it works for everybody. So being too visible is like, you know, I was wearing a 5950, you know what I mean? Like some nice sneakers that I got from like uh, mm. Chris for my, for, for my birthday. Some uh, KD Trey 58s. As I remember, and, uh, hey. and, uh, yeah, you, you, were style, you were styling there, Pablo. You were too, too fresh for them. You're too and fresh. A five hundred dollars <laughs> suit from Suit Supply. It wasn't like I was dressed like a fucking bum, right? Now I came in here like you know what I mean, two to nine, as far as I'm concerned. But I didn't necessarily look like everybody else. It's true. You know, what I mean? that, most people here try to. I don't know. If I, I'm not going to remark on how the other colleagues dress and stuff like that. But like everybody <laughs> has their own style. That was mine. Right. That was mine. You know what I mean? And, I deal with it. Right? And that's and that's fine. We know you. We know you have to run. But I think the last thing we need to ask you for sure is where are we on things with immigration in this country yes. we are both children of immigrants uh i myself and brian is as, as well as you are uh too i'm kind of kind of assuming but where are we you guys are there asking the questions to the biden administration to the people in congress and in the house like you know congress and the senate where where they are keep we putting it off and it yeah a lot of things are getting pushed yeah. back some people seem like they don't want to address the issue but where are we on immigration in this country yeah I, okay so I, I can offer two scenarios yes um, somewhere and nowhere <laughs> somewhere <laughs> and nowhere okay um i know it sucks but uh nowhere so here's the thing there is the possibility of passing meaningful immigration reform in Congress this year through what's called a Budget Reconciliation Act. The Budget Reconciliation Act doesn't require 10 Republicans because we have such a razor thin margin of Democrats in the uh, in the Senate um, and and uh, after the, 20, the 2020 election. Um, they, if 50 Democrats vote together and Vice President Kamala Harris comes up to the Hill and presides over the vote for budget reconciliation, they can pass a massive spending bill, right? Like Donald Trump did this a couple of times. One for, I think it was for tax cuts. The other one was for COVID relief. We did one, uh, uh, sorry, the, the new president did one. Um, and the, Joe Biden sent, uh, signed a COVID relief bill through the same process. Uh, but the COVID relief bill that he signed left immigrants completely out in the dark, uh, out. Like, you know, no, immigrants did not get stimulus, uh, undocumented immigrants did not get stimulus checks. They did not get any of these benefits. 
Um, so now we're at reconciliation again, and the Senate is saying that we need to get permission from a Hill staffer named the, called the Senate Parliamentarian in order to include uh, citizenship or some form of relief for immigrants within the budget reconciliation package. The Parliamentarian has been very negative in these pitches that have come r- largely from Senator Dick Durbin's office uh, to her office saying, no, absolutely not. Immigrants don't get anything in this congressional package, right? Um, and it seems like to most immigrants, uh, to most advocates who are pro-immigrant advocates, who are immigrant rights advocates at this point, that they're just getting the runaround. It's the same thing that they've been getting for 35 years, just the runaround from Democrats. And, you know, Republicans will actively seek to destroy immigrants when they take power, and Democrats will just give immigrants the runaround. So a lot of people think it's the runaround right now. That's nowhere. That's the nowhere scenario. Scenario one, which I think most people in uh, the insider thinking of Washington would say that is likely scenario one. Now, there is... A something, something being, you know, not nothing, but the other scenario being something. And the something is what I'm hearing is called a substitute amendment, right? A motion to commit a binding substitute amendment to the reconciliation bill, it's, I think is how it's termed. Uh, but basically what that amounts to, as it's been explained to me, is that it's an 11th hour last minute maneuver to add a massive immigration reform plan to the budget reconciliation bill and overrule the parliamentarian. This too requires all 50 votes plus the presiding officer. As I understand it, it's binding. A lot of people are like, I don't know if that's possible or not because it it essentially amounts to writing like citizenship on a post-it and sticking it on the bill. (laughs) But um, that's kind of what Republicans did with a lot of their bills during the, during Republican rule. So there exists the possibility of an 11th hour Kamala Harris taking the trip up to uh, Capitol Hill saying and the motion to submit a binding resolution to a substitute amendment that sticks at maybe the House version that includes like a lot of immigration legalization provisions has been tabled. We, you know, vote. I OK, the motion is the motion is passed. Boom. And then everybody's a citizen. That doesn't sound exactly like uh it doesn't. It sounds possible if, if if Republicans were in charge because they tend to pull out all the stops and get anything they need to through through the legislative process. But it doesn't sound like something that Democrats have been willing to do in the past. I've spoken with Joe Manchin. He says that immigration is likely too big for the reconciliation process. But again, like there is, if you think about it, Democrats all during all this time, there are many off ramps they could have taken with it when it comes to the immigration push. They could have been like, you know what, we're done with this. It's not happening. Um, but. They, if they, if at some point during this negotiation they had said, "Okay, guys, yep, it's approved. We're putting immigration in this budget reconciliation package," then we would not be talking about paid family leave. We would not be talking about uh, free community college. We would not be talking about uh, all these different things that are in the budget reconciliation package right now, because the right wing media in this country would have taken over, and the only thing we would be talking about in this package right now is immigration. It would be, "Oh my God, it's an amnesty for illegal," <laughs> and, you know, like that. That would be like the whole chorus. So there, ex- there is at least some logic to the notion that Democrats are just playing a stall game so they can stick immigration in at the 11th hour, right? Uh-huh. Um, I don't know if that is actually a legal parliamentary procedure that they envision to do something like this, uh, but there exists a possibility. And AOC, uh, Ro Khanna, um, Lou Correa, Ed, Adriano Espilat, um, and Chewy Garcia in the House are all pushing for that. 43 members, I think, on Thursday. Thursday mm-hmm. or Friday signed a letter basically saying, like, this is what we need to do. We need to tell the parliamentarian we're going to do. disregard her through a motion to blah, 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 and <laughs> immigration at the last minute. <laughs> so there is a so, movement for it. <laughs> so like you said, somewhere and somewhere. nowhere. Somewhere. 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 Yeah. somewhere somewhere and nowhere. Pablo, yeah. we, know, we know we'll you got to run. <laughs> yeah, and we'll see. We know you got to <laughs> run. We think you're doing great work there. Yes, uh, keep, fighting, keep fighting the good fight, and the representation is much needed. That's Pablo Manriquez, Latino Rebels Capital Correspondent. Yes, Thank sir. you, brother. We, we appreciate you, man. Thank, Thank you, Pablo. Pablo. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mom, one time. All right, one time for your mind this week. We have some interesting things to talk about. Brian's got some stuff that he definitely wants to speak on about his Native, not native country, was born, wasn't born there, but where his people are from, Puerto Rico. Brian, what you got for one time for your mind? There's a story that came out on CNN. Uh, I believe it was yesterday. So two days from when you're listening to this because it came out on Sunday. And it's called How Puerto Rico Became the Most Vaccinated Place on Earth. Hmm. 73% vaccination rate in PR right now. 
more than anywhere else in the United States and technically their United States territory as we know. Uh, so look, it had to be done kind of by necessity, but at the same time, like I was, I was impressed and I was also a little worried because I'm like, damn, son, the vaccination rate 73, like, that's really good. But I'm like, yo, the rest of us need to get our shit together. Um, I looked up New York and I believe it was in the, the mid 60s or high 60s, fully vaccinated rate. So, yeah, shout out to Puerto Rico because they got that done. Uh, look, still a lot of people dealing with Hurricane Maria and then other stuff that's going on out there in general. Politically, you guys should read up on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think that it was very encouraging to see that 73%. It's a great number and it's obviously growing. And uh, like, I hope that it continues to climb and I hope it continues to climb elsewhere so we can finally be done with this pandemic. Yeah, that's, that's greatly done by Puerto Rico. You know, like you said, I don't really have much more to add than I wish other people would get closer to those numbers so they can have herd, immun- herd immunity, excuse me, in a whole bunch of different places. Like, that actually would be nice. Good job for Puerto Rico. Brian, you need to wave that flag. For Definitely. sure. Word. Put them on Put them on the all-vaccination team. We can do Word. That. There yeah. we go. Kyrie Irving will not be on that. That's for sure. <laughs> we know that. All right, my one time for your mind has to do with streaming shows. So I've wondered this for a long time, Brian. I've always wanted to know, okay, you put it on Netflix and you see what shows are popular or who's ranked number one. What you know, it's like, all right, how do we know this? How does Netflix determine this? Uh, Netflix has always been pretty tight lipped about their numbers and statistics about how many people watch shows and how many people you know stream or whatever. So we don't know. But recently, with the popularity of Squid Game. Which I don't know if you've watched, Brian, but I have not watched Squid Game. I haven't, yet. but I've heard that I should. I will. I plan. I plan to start it this week. I have not watched it yet, um, but there's been a lot of talk about it with that popularity. This was. Uh, this data probably has the numbers have probably gone up, but this was as of October twentieth, a mind boggling 142 million accounts have tuned in to Squid Game. Now that doesn't mean people watched the entire series or shit, even watch an entire episode. It just means that people watch the show for at least two minutes. That's what the company is saying. Netflix is saying. They've watched the show for at least two minutes. Now, I'm not sure. I don't like that's, that. Yeah, see, I wanted to... See, I now, tell, like now hold on. Now, we'll pause right there. Why don't you like it? Two minutes? Like, it, it, if you told me that amount of people, whatever it was, 140 mm-hmm. some million. 142 million. Mm-hmm. 142 million. Watched half the first episode, I think that that, like, you know, would would be more substantial for me. But two minutes, it's like we, I, I remember, like, people joke about this, but, like, do we know what a stream actually is in music, for example, right? Mm. And I've read different things about what counts, eight seconds, two seconds, five seconds. Like, that's dumb. I think that, and I think even Spotify, like, I'm confused as to, like, what counts as a played song, because for me, there have been songs that have showed up on my, like, you know, they'll make these playlists of songs that you often repeat or whatever the case may be. And I found a couple songs on there. Like, I don't really listen to this shit at all. I always skip it. But like, maybe sometimes it'll play for a few seconds before I skip it mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. And it ends up on there. So I'm like, wait, does that count as a play? Does that count as a stream? Like, that's kind of bogus. So uh, the way we're counting some of these things, the numbers look gaudy. But when they look overly gaudy like that, I'm a little suspicious of that. Good. All, all good points, right? So. The way the most frequent yardstick that Netflix uses to measure audience is the total number of accounts to watch a show or movie for at least two minutes during the first 28 days of the release, right? But see, the problem for me is with that two minute threshold, you know, let's say you watch a and Netflix what, a movie automatically or show. plays the shit for you sometimes. That's a very good point, right? Which means that some shows or movies are being watched, and I have air quotes for people who are listening to this podcast. Before the viewer even arrives at the main title sequence, right? Like some shows start off with something in the beginning, some of it is a recap, and that counts as the time, right? So, you know, it's just, it's kind of more, and this is what people have been calling it from this article I read. It's like you're really sampling a Netflix title, you're not watching it, which I agree with. Like two minutes is a sample, right? That's not an actual view. That's like listening to a song. I'm glad Brian brought up music for 30 seconds, right? Like that's, you're not you. You haven't really listened to it. You could hear it for thirty seconds. You're like, yo, I might be feeling this beat. The person might be spitting some whack shit, and you just want to get out. Like, that makes sense to me, 
right? Another thing is Netflix stats also aren't independently verified, nor are they backed up by detailed data uh, from their from themselves. So, you know, it, the problem that people talked about is kind of puts them in the position to cherry pick highlights without much transparency at all, right? So it, it's it's really interesting, and there was this good article, and I'll tell people where this was uh, on CNET by Jason Solzman um, that has that has these numbers and kind of looks into how they're looking at what the most popular shows are. Squid Game right now, which is like easily the most popular show in the last like 28 days looked at. Like it's 142 million accounts have watched it. Bridgerton, which came out earlier this year, it's 82 million accounts. So it's like kind of not even close, right? And so there's these, these all these ways they do it and look at it. And I just feel like, I guess the point is just that like, I think we have to look at what Brian was talking about, which is what's the difference between watching something and sampling something. Like, I'm not sure exactly what that number is, but I like more of that. Now, prior, last thing I'll say is prior to 2020, Netflix used to count these views differently. They would count something as watched when you got through 70% of it, which I feel like that's pretty fair, right? Like 70% seems like a pretty good number. That's either of the first episode of a series or film's total runtime. So you have to get 70% of that first episode or 70% of that movie within the first 28 days of its release. Now Netflix is saying that the new two-minute threshold is more fair to all titles regardless of their length. But I'm like, nah, it's not. Like... I just, I don't like it. I feel like the 70%, regardless of how long, whatever it is, is probably more accurate. So it's just, yeah, I, I don't know. We, we have to really take a look at how we're looking at data, how we're viewing these things as a whole with media, whether it's music, movies, or whatever. But yeah, I think like a two-minute sampling, yeah, we can't, we can't be for that. Yeah, All right. Especially for something that's like, I don't know how long the episodes are for Squid Game. But, yeah, I don't know either. But even it, like thirty minutes, sixty minutes, like two minutes is nothing, right? Like I like the seventy percent number. I, I, I think, think it's a good number. I don't even think it needs to be that high. Like if you told me, if you told me it was twenty five percent, I feel like that's enough of a sample to say like you watched an episode or whatever the case may be. For, for I might want to, you know what? Maybe the seventy percent because you know what? You come back to something. I might actually say yeah, thirty percent seems fair. I, there. Uh, but my last point would be like, look, on the flip side, if this helps the creatives putting these things together, so be it. Ain't you know, be mad at that. so can't, be it. You know, can't be, can't be mad at let that. it go. Let it let if it gets if it gets people paid, if it gets people like us paid, hopefully uh, for certain things like that, then sure, I'm all for it. Make it make it one second. Yeah. <laughs> if that's going to be the case. <laughs> yeah, if that's the case. You know what? Yeah, I don't know what the views are going to be in this podcast or what counts as listen, but we'd <laughs> like that you listen to 100% of it. That's yeah. what we'd like you to do. Uh, so hopefully you listen to 100% of this podcast. That's it for this episode of the A Hard Tell Podcast, episode 199, the last episode in triple digits with a one in front of it. Please continue to support us. Follow the A Hard Tell Podcast on Instagram on Facebook, on Twitter, of course. We appreciate all your support. Share it. Tell a friend. Do all that. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.